Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but God alone, without any partners, and I bear witness that Muhammad is God's servant and messenger. Peace and blessings of God be upon him, his family, and his companions. And may peace, the mercy of God, and blessings be upon you all today. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> no, I didn't accidentally write this talk for our January Jumma prayer gathering. Last week, we entered the month of Muharram, which signifies the beginning of the Islamic year 1439, so that's been 1,439 years after Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, emigrated to Medina from Mecca. Coincidentally, this year, Rosh Hashanah, the holiday celebrating the Jewish New Year, began one day before the Islamic New Year. Unlike in other faith traditions and secular cultures, the Islamic New Year is not generally set aside as a special holiday. However, we do hold the 10th day of the New Year as sacred. This day is known as Ashura, literally meaning 10th in Arabic, and it begins tomorrow night at sunset. Ashura is unique among Islamic holy days in that although it is observed by both Sunni and Shia Muslims, the reasons for commemorating the day, along with the associated acts of worship, are completely different between the two branches. Speaking from personal experience, people may not know or realize that Ashura is observed in such different ways. Others may believe that only one branch is properly keeping Ashura, while the other branches' forms of worship are considered incorrect or even deviant. I will be exploring the foundational stories behind both the Sunni and Shia observances of Ashura and considering the lessons we can take from both of them. In the Sunni tradition, Ashura is observed as the day when Moses and the children of Israel were freed from slavery in Egypt. God narrates this in chapter 26, verses 52 through 68 of the Quran. And God says, And we inspired to Moses, Travel by night with my servants. Indeed, you will be pursued. Then Pharaoh sent mobilizers to all the cities to say, These are just a small band of people, and they have truly enraged us, but we are a multitude on the alert. So we removed from them gardens and springs, treasures and places of honor. Thus it was, and we made the children of Israel inheritors of it all. So Pharaoh and his people pursued them at sunrise. When the two groups saw each other, the companions of Moses said, We are sure to be overtaken. Moses said, Certainly not. My Lord is indeed with me, and my Lord will guide me. Then we inspired Moses, saying, Strike the sea with your staff, and it parted, each side like a huge mountain. We brought the pursuers near there, and we saved Moses and all that were there with him. Then we drowned the others. Truly there is a sign in this, but most of them do not have faith. And indeed, your Lord is the Almighty and the most merciful. Traditionally, Sunni Muslims observe Ashura as a day of fasting. A sound hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, one of the major collections of Sunni hadiths, describes how when the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was living in Medina, he noticed that the Jewish communities there were fasting on Ashura. When he inquired about this, he was told that they were following the practice of Moses, who fasted as thanks to God for delivering the children of Israel to freedom. Upon hearing this, the Prophet encouraged Muslims to do the same. Another hadith found in Sahih Muslim, one of the other major Sunni hadith collections, narrates that the Prophet said, For fasting the day of Ashura, I hope God will expiate for the sins one committed in the previous year. Thus, many Sunni Muslims will fast on Ashura in honor of the children of Israel's freedom and as a means to have their sins of the past year forgiven. For Shia Muslims, Ashura is also a day of remembrance, but the occasion being remembered is far less joyous than the commemorating freedom from Pharaoh. Ashura marks the anniversary of the day Imam Hussein, the beloved grandson of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was killed at the Battle of Karbala in 680 Common Era, 61 years after the Prophet's migration to Medina. Hussein, his family, and a band of his supporters were on their way to the town of Kufa in Iraq, 
where he would serve as their leader and resist the rule of Yazid, the controversial Umayyad Caliph, who was viewed by many as corrupt and unfit to be the leader of the Muslims. However, on the way to Kufa, they were met by Yazid's forces in Karbala, located in central Iraq, who had come to stop what they considered an uprising and a threat to Yazid's power. Although they fought bravely, Hussein's few dozen companions were no match for Yazid's soldiers that numbered in the thousands. Hussein and all the adult men were killed, and the surviving women and children were rounded up and forced to march to Damascus, the capital of the Umayyad Caliphate, as prisoners of war, where many died along the way. Every year on Ashura, as well as the days leading up to it, and up to 40 days afterwards, Shia Muslims will gather together and recount the story of Karbala, remember the sacrifices that Imam Hussein and his family made for the Muslim Ummah, and mourn all of the losses that occurred. The death of any beloved religious figure is sorrowful, but it is the circumstances surrounding Hussein's death that make it particularly tragic. Not only was Hussein the grandson of the Prophet, for Shia Muslims he's considered for most Shia Muslims, he's considered one of 12 infallible Muslim leaders who has been granted divine knowledge, wisdom, and excellent character. The people of Kufa had promised to accept Hussein as their leader, but while he was en route to them, they pledged allegiance to Yazid instead, leaving him without any protection. The Umayyad soldiers blocked off access to the Euphrates River so that Hussein's people, including the non-combatant women and children, had no way to get water. The bodies of those who were killed, including Hussein, were mutilated. Their camp was looted. The women were forced to remove clothing and unwillingly expose their bodies to their captors as a form of humiliation, and they were brought to live in a dungeon in Damascus. Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had always preached unity and forbade oppression, but a mere 50 years after he died, his own family was oppressed by fellow Muslims. I didn't learn about any of this until years after I started studying Islam. When I first started studying the religion, and when I ultimately converted during my first year of college, almost all of my Islamic knowledge was from Sunni sources because that's all that was available to me. I didn't know any Shia students at my school, and there were no Shia mosques nearby for me to visit. Ashura for me was a day of fasting and enjoying what I viewed as a kind of Islamic Passover, a holiday that, that I had grown up celebrating with my Jewish mother. In my sophomore year of college, I became friends with a new first-year Muslim student named Marcin, an Iraqi-American Shia from Kansas. A couple days before Ashura of that year, I asked her if she was going to fast. She said that Shias generally don't fast on Ashura because fasting is considered a joyful act of worship and thus isn't appropriate for a day of mourning. This was news to me, so I did some research and was quite surprised to learn about this whole other side to Ashura that I was totally unfamiliar with before. Although I consider myself a Sunni Muslim and have not participated in Shia acts of worship for Ashura, I do think there is a lot of value in recognizing Ashura as a solemn day of mourning. It forces people to acknowledge the uncomfortable truth of the existence of evil in the world. Not only did this terrible event happen, it happened to the family of the Prophet, who were by all accounts good, upright people. It is a reminder that suffering afflicts everyone, even good people. Harun Mogul, an American author and academic, points out that unlike Moses and his people who won their fight against oppression, Hussein and his people lost theirs. As much as we wish for it to be true, life is not always fair, and even someone with as high a status as Hussein may not always come out on top, at least in this earthly life. It also challenges the popular narrative of the perfect Islamic past, where everything was better back in the first few generations of Muslims compared to the problems and trials we're dealing with in the present day. Without the direct supervision and guidance of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, it was inevitable that corruption and neglect of his message and example would occur, even so soon after his death. The people of pre-Islamic Arabia were considered to be in jahiliya, or living in ignorance. It is clear, however, that even after the coming of Islam, many people still remained ignorant of the core ethical teachings of Islam, despite calling themselves Muslim. This brings to mind what God says in chapter 49, verse 14 in the Quran. The dwellers of the desert say, we believe. Say, you have not yet believed, but you should say, we have submitted, because faith has not yet entered into your hearts. If you obey God and God's messenger, God will not put any of your works to waste. God is forgiving and merciful. This is a reminder to us that even though we may call ourselves Muslim, we need to back it up with our actions. One aspect of Shia observance of Ashura that I have become more aware of over the past few years is using the day as an illustration of how little things have changed. The Battle of Karbala was not an isolated, one-time incident. 
Acts of injustice, where the oppressed and those who are fighting for justice are forcefully silenced, or worse, happen literally every day, even as I'm speaking right now. White supremacist policies and attitudes in this country and the world keep people of color perpetually marginalized. The gap between rich and poor countries continues to grow exponentially, with fewer and fewer resources available to those who need them most. Women remain without the same legal and social treatment as men in the USA and around the world. The legal rights of LGBTQ people are either non-existent or in danger of being revoked. Oppression isn't just the domain of governments and whole societies either. It also happens on a micro level, at school, work, even at home among families. A parent may physically, verbally, and emotionally abuse their children, for example, or a boss may force their employees to put in extra work without fair compensation. Unfortunately, there are countless other examples. When people try to challenge these injustices, they're mocked, villainized, punished, or even killed. There is a famous slogan that is attributed to Ali Shariati, a 20th century Iranian sociologist that illustrates this sentiment. Every day is Ashura, and every land is Karbala. Although the Sunni and Shia observances of Ashura may seem to be quite the opposite, I believe it is possible to keep both messages in mind and learn from both of them. They're also not as contrary as one may think. Joy and sorrow are both part of life, and oftentimes they exist simultaneously. God confirms this in the Quran in chapter 94, verse 5. Truly, with every hardship comes ease. It is possible to feel happiness and thanksgiving for the freedom of the children of Israel, while at the same time feeling grief for Imam Hussein and the events at Karbala. Just as we learn the importance of resisting oppression from Hussein, we can learn the importance of remaining persistent and trusting in God from Moses. In just a few minutes, God willing, we'll hear Sister Shabnam deliver a khutbah discussing the vital role women played in both the story of Karbala, specifically Hussein's sister Zainab, and the story of Moses, specifically Moses' mother. This Ashura, I want to try and combine these various lessons to create a different way of looking at the day. I will fast, as I always do, as tradition says Moses and Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did, and I will give thanks to God for letting good triumph over evil when God prevented Pharaoh and his people from ever harming the children of Israel ever again. I will also take time to reflect on the story of Karbala and the bravery that Imam Hussein and his family showed in the midst of injustice, and I will remember that such injustice still occurs today. In honor of Hussein, I will donate to an organization that aids people suffering from oppression, and I will renew my commitment to enjoin justice and what is right and condemn what is wrong. This goal in particular is very important. Sometimes it can be easy to forget that we ourselves can be oppressors, even if we don't realize it or intend to do so. This is especially easy to do in cases of systemic oppression, such as race or class privilege, where it's so ingrained in society that our unearned advantages over others are mostly invisible. Regular self-reflection and a willingness to recognize our faults and correct them is crucial for putting a stop to oppressive practices and reaching our goal of being the best that we can be. God willing, we will become a world where there will be no more Karbalas, and we will all be as free as the day when Moses and his people finished crossing the sea. O oh God, O oh merciful one, you are the one who oversees all things. Thank you for sending us the beautiful example of Moses, Moses' mother, Imam Hussein, Zainab, and all righteous people. Please help us take inspiration from them in our life journeys and keep us always on the straight path. Please help us be witnesses and allies to the oppressed and save us from becoming oppressors. Bless those who are suffering in body, mind, and spirit, and grant them peace of mind, patience, and strength, and reward them for their suffering. Let us all be among those who submit our whole selves to you and those who have faith in you and those who are close to you. Grant us all the best in this life and in the hereafter. Amen.